uh, on to natural language processing. So what is natural pro language processing? So it encompasses a lot of domain with different like overlapping. So it can go from machine translation to text to speech, uh, speech to text, text classification, automatic Q&A answering. Um, OCR, sentiment analysis, so we're not going to cover everything, but actually convolutions are used uh, across all these domains. So a few NLP facts, um, 1.3 trillion, that's the value of company's data. Um, 8.4 petabytes of information per second will be produced as of 2020. 10% of the organization are expected to commercialize the data by 2020 and 17% of companies use customer feedback. I don't know what the others are doing, but it means a lot of this data that's creating all the time is actually text-based. There's lots of text that sit there, uh, could be analyzed, could be uh, mined for uh, information. And we're gonna show a few techniques that lets you do that at scale on a high uh, precision. So how do you apply convolutions to natural language processing? So we have this problem of data representation because uh, it was quite obvious for images because images are uh, composed of, for example, three channels. Each channel is composed of like, values, numbers between 0 and 255, for example. And then you apply your convolution on this data. So straightforward. For speech, you have different techniques. Actually, you can work with a raw waveform, which is a like very new and only been done in the last few years by DeepMind. And otherwise you can use a spectral representation. So you, you transform your uh, temporal representation into the spectral uh, representation and you use that as images. So for example, there was a, this paper from um, uh, Microsoft on uh, speech recognition, which uh, took the waveform, the derivative of the waveform, and the second derivative took their did the frequency analysis and used this as uh, images that were fed into convolutional neural networks. But when you have text like this, when I read some of the rules of, for speaking the English language correctly, I think any fool can make a rule and every fool will mind it. So how do you represent that so that you can apply convolution um, on them? Well, you have different solutions. Uh, the first people were attempting that they used a word level representation. So they used word embedding, which is when you represent a word in a feature space of a fixed dimension, for example, uh, word to vec. And these embeddings were concatenated together and the, the uh, convolutions were applied across um, the feature, the feature uh, dimension. On a, and the variation of the kernel size would be along the time dimension. So this is good, pretty good uh, results, but we'll actually go in details into a second representation, which is to do it actually at the character level. So forget about word, and you can use um, one-hot encoding of characters. So one-hot encoding, what does it mean? So you have a letter, you have a, an alphabet, a dictionary of characters that are acceptable, and each letter is represented, or each character actually, is represented as a vector with lots of zeros and a one with a corresponding value. So here you have Vancouver and LP represented in a one hot encoded form on this alphabet. So it gives a question of which alphabet you use. Do you use uh, every letter, the ASCII um, set? Do you use only lowercase? Do you take into account special character or Unicode? Actually, some people are using now byte level uh, representation, even for Unicode. So we're going to apply that to the uh, oldest trick in the book, the text classification. For You have some text, and you're trying to classify that into a category. For example, we say you, you have some text, and you want to know if it's a play or a news article or a textbook or something. And in that, you, you take the input, you put it through your neural networks, and you get the output. Traditionally, you had to do a lot of pre-processing, tokenization, word stop removal. So you had the entire NLP pipeline. But the advantage of um, deep neural networks is it, it goes away with all that. You take the raw characters and feed them straight to your 
uh, neural networks. So people were doing that. Uh, well, Xiang Zhang, Junbo, Tao, and Yan Lequin from uh, the Facebook AI Research Group. They published this really interesting paper called Character Level Convolutional Neural Networks for Text Classification. And how this um, network for us, it's split in several steps. So first you get the raw text. You have the quantization step where you transform your text into these one hot encoded uh, vectors. Then you have uh, convolution. So convolution is followed by, um, so we also call that temporal convolution because it's done across the entire uh, temporal dimension. In that case, uh, the character representation. Then you have max pooling. Then you have followed um, a few more uh, convolutions of kernel uh, three by three, uh, three by uh, temporal um, uh, dimension. And then you have, you flatten your output and you perform um, some fully connected layers uh, to classify your document into the categories that you want to train it on. So let's see how we can, uh, and we're going to follow, basically we're going to follow what happens from a document, from a text, all the way to the end, to the classification, just to understand really how this convolution works with text and how, how the network works. So first you get your text, um, let's say here of Vancouver, it gets encoded same way as in the previous slides. And we're going to use the same uh, numbers as in the paper. So in the paper, they use an alphabet of size 69, and they uh, have a fixed length for their input of 1014 characters. So if it's too short, it's padded. If it's too long, it's truncated. So what we do is we do a 7 by 69 convolution and we get the result into a uh, feature map, which is uh, one by 1008. Yeah, so we do that. So each mask produces one number, as you can see, and then you're gonna have uh, six elements which are lost because there is no padding here. So that's why you go from 1013, which is 1014 elements, to 1007. So we do that a thousand and eight times. We go all the way to the end, and then we start again with a different uh, mask. And this mask, um, we have 256 of them until we get our entire feature map. So if you remember a bit like the representation, actually, these feature maps, you can represent them as a matrix for an easier to understand, but actually they are more like stacked on top of each other. So that's the result of one uh, convolution operation. And then we have 256 of them. So that was the quantization step followed by the convolution step. This convolution are followed by nonlinear activation. So what is a rectified linear unit? You might have heard of it or called ReLU. It's pretty simple. Uh, it consists of uh, setting everything that's negative to zero. Uh, previously, people used um, different activation like uh, uh, tan uh, hyperbolic, but uh, we realized that it's much faster, much simpler actually to use ReLU because if you look at the derivative of this function, it's zero and one. So it allows very uh, efficient um, uh, gradient calculation. So we then enter the done sampling or the max pooling operation. So if you remember from uh, what I was talking about at the beginning, you have uh, your feature maps and we're going to apply uh, three, one by three kernel on our uh, features. So this means that the maximum number in here is going to be there. And then we're going to use a stride of three which means the next number is here. So we're going to actually divide by three um, the number of elements in our um, feature maps. So we go from 256 elements, 256,000 elements to 86.
So that was the max pooling um, operation. So I'm not going to go into details into every layer. So after this max pooling, we actually have um, three, uh, four uh, convolutional layers, one after each other, without max pooling inside. And they have a kernel of uh, one by three this time. And then we have a final max pooling layer, which brings down the number of elements to about 9,000. So we have our nine or elements, which are our feature maps, which are one by uh, 34. And what we want is have all that into one big uh, vector. So we're going to have a flattening operation, which is pretty simple. What it does is take each uh, feature map and then put it one after each other. So this one is here. So we don't change the number of dimension. Uh, we simply append every feature map we after each other. So this about 9,000 elements, we're going to feed them into a dense uh, layer. So if you remember the dense layer, every single neuron is connected to every single input. So we have 1,024 units here connected to 9,000 elements. That's already 9 million parameters just for this layer. So we have uh, 1,024 units. And this, they all give you a number, which is like the multiplication of the weight, B, which is input plus a bias. And this output is passed through a ReLU which you can see the zero uh, on the screen here. And this really then passed to a dropout layer. So what is dropout? Dropout is uh, the, the fact of randomly hiding uh, certain units. So usually we use 50%. Uh, so this is uh, useful because if you don't do that in a very deep neural network, the so next layer is gonna learn um, what's called the constellations of uh, activations. So it's going to depend uh, very highly on um, units being activated at the same time. By doing this, you force the network to not rely on the fact that a unit is here or not, is activated or not. So each unit is going to be much more uh, specialized into one specific thing or a few specific things together. And obviously, at inference time, we don't do that. The dropouts are uh, removed, and then the uh, activation are scaled by the uh, dropout factor. So these 1,024 units are connected to another 1,024 dense uh, layer. So now we arrive actually at the final uh, layer, the output layer for the network. We have 1,024 values that we connect uh, after dropout to n units. Each unit is for one category. So for example, let's say we have um, like 10 type of documents and we're going to have 10 units. The output of these uh, units are going to be used for deciding which category the network thinks uh, the document belongs to. However, to be able to use this output as a um, like probability, we're going to use what's called the softmax activation. So softmax, what it does, it's just like normalization uh, function. It takes every number, put it to the exponential, and divide it by the sum of the exponential of all the other ones. And this gives you number between 0 and 1 for each of them. And with the strong phases, if one is bigger than the others, it's going to have very high probability or very high number. So in that case, let's say the last category was the right one. We have 0.8. Um, great. That's, that's our category. So to summarize, we, we showed how you can go from a document, do some quantization, apply some convolution, reduce dimension with a max pooling, and then feed them to some more convolutions, more max pooling, get the feature, the feature maps, flatten them, 
the flatten um, representation is fed through two uh, dense layer with like 1024 units each and then the output of this dense layer is fed through n units each for uh, one of our category we want to classify so let's say this output was documentation well that, that's a play that's not correct so how do we train the network to give the right output so we do we do like the dog we go backward and we fix everything that we did wrong so that's called backward propagation and which allows efficient gradient descent basically what we want we want to say a hey, that wasn't documentation should have been play and the fact that it should have been play it sh should have changed the weights um, of our last layer and then should have changed basically using um, the back propagation rule we can change each weight towards the direction that would have minimized the final error so we pass a few documents together into a batch it's called we look at the error we look at what should have changed for it to be less wrong and we update the weight with the average of this batch um, updates so that next time hopefully it's going to be less wrong so that's a high level overview of how how the training works i'm not going to go into details of the back uh, backward propagation so we have a few parameters that are useful during training for example we have the learning rate so how much do we want to update the weights on every uh, batch so if you put a too big learning rate it's basically going to be like the first example we start here we know we need to go a bit on the right because we're going to uh, overshoot the local minima and then oh we should go back on the left and then like that you could sometimes never converge or the weights are just going to, to to go crazy basically and if you put a small learning rate you're going to move small step by small step sometimes too small and sometimes you'll never leave a local minima so you need to find the right balance um, between these two extremes so the batch size is how many documents do you want to learn uh, at once if you put a small small batch size and you're not using your gpu at its best and if you use a very large batch size then you might just get noise basically you get if your network is not um, trained at all it's like initial uh, randomly initialized you go your update your weights your gradients are going to want to move in every direction and doing the average of uh, thousands of documents might just give you random noise so sometimes you can use uh, it's called a learning rate schedule so at the beginning you have small learning rates in order for your network to learn the right direction uh, towards a minimum of errors and then you increase the learning rate once in the right direction so that uh, training happens faster you can also play with number of epoch so one epoch is when you f feed the network the entire data set but sometimes it's not enough to see one example once so you're going to feed it uh, many times 